Dr. Oksana Bihun was born in Ukraine in 1980. She plays the piano, bandura, and guitar. After graduating from the Ivan Franco National University in Ukraine as an applied mathematician, she worked as a research and teaching assistant and sang in a choir. She then continued her mathematical studies at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Having earned her PhD in mathematics in 2009, she worked as a professor at Concordia College and the University of Colorado. Her high quality research is featured in the Academic Minute and she served academia zealously, zealously by organizing lectures and meetings, contributing to numerous committees, giving talks and reviewing papers. In particular, her service includes the organization of a student chapter of the Association for Women in Mathematics. All of these led to her earning tenure and promotion to associate professor in 2019. She was accepted into the National Society of Writers of Ukraine in 2019, and her poetry won two awards. The same year, she earned tenure as a math professor. While she was proud of this accomplishment, she resigned from her position and joined her husband in Moorhead, Minnesota. Dr. Bihun now studies in the Masters of Counseling program at Minnesota State University. Since June of 2020, she is the creator of the YouTube channel Self Care for Body, Mind and Spirit, featuring playlists with, with her original music compositions and poetry, vignettes on mindfulness and daily life, as well as tutorials on emotional hygiene, the survival of workplace mobbing, emotional abuse and psychological trauma. Welcome, Dr. Bihun, and thank you so much for joining me again for our talk on workplace mobbing. I'm really excited that you could join me today. Thank you, Ms. Osmond. It's, it's a, uh, an honor to be featured on your channel. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Thank you for that compliment. It's an honor to have you. And we, Dr. Bihun and I are going to discuss this issue of workplace mobbing and it's a term that is heard of but has not really come to the public consciousness fully at this point point. and if we could get into it a little bit Dr. Bihun what is workplace mobbing what is the definition of what this is Yes, so there are several definitions of workplace mobbing. I'll try to give a, a, as inclusive definition as possible. Uh, so workplace mobbing, it is a form of psychological or physical abuse at work that has the following properties. So uh, this abuse is per per perpetrated by a group, uh, that group is called a mob, and it is directed onto one individual or a group, which is called the target. Uh, it is a systemic issue, so the organizational culture and structure play a negative role in this phenomenon. It's not just a personality conflict. Uh, the abusive behaviors are repetitive and continue for a prolonged period of time. Uh, so we wouldn't call workplace mobbing just a one-time event. Uh, usually it, it goes on six months or more, and actually some research shows that uh, an average episode of workplace mobbing can be as long as 1.7 years. Uh, the negative acts include verbal abuse, undermining, unfairness, sabotage, obstruction, vindictiveness, cruelty, intimidation, humiliation, devaluation, discreditation of the target and others. So this is not an exhaustive list, but this is, these are just some examples. Uh, so the abusive behaviors are executed intentionally or unconsciously. So there is, a, there is actually a disagreement in literature. In some literature, when they define workplace mobbing, they say it has to be intentional. However, my point of view and some other researchers um, think that intentionality is very difficult to ascertain, it is very difficult to check whether somebody was intentional or, or not, and actually unconscious behaviors are possible. Uh, workplace mobbing causes health harming effects in the target, uh, including severe mental or somatic illness. And if it is not stopped, it will lead to the target's expulsion from the unit or the organization. So a short definition is that it's just a, a form of psychological abuse that is being that is prolonged and happens in the workplace. And it's a group behavior 
uh, and a long definition is everything that I just said. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Dr. Bihun, if I am not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there are stages to this. Can, can we talk about what those stages are and how can a target know what stage they are in or possibly about to enter? Yes. So the, uh, originally the term workplace mobbing was introduced by Heinz Leimann. It's a Swedish, Swedish psychologist. Uh, he already passed away. He introduced this term in 1980s and he delineated five stages to workplace mobbing. So the first stage is a critical incident, a conflict. So uh, a conflict is just the first stage and uh, it doesn't have to progress all through all of the other stages. But in case of workplace mobbing, it will progress to emotionally abusing, abusive acts that trigger mobbing, mobbing dynamics. So basically uh, the conflict progresses into, um, into emotional abuse. Uh, the third stage is that the management gets involved and unfortunately the management uh, withholds support from the abused employee, uh, passes erroneous judgment, misjudges the situation and begins the expulsion process. Uh, the fourth stage is that the victim of mobbing is branded as difficult or mentally ill. Um, and the colleagues of the and the health professionals are ascribe the, all the problems to the difficulties of the personality of the target. Uh, so basically, the the victim is blamed for the mobbing. And the fifth stage of workplace mobbing is the expulsion. So either the target is going to resign or they are going to be fired. Uh, and the trauma of this and other mobbing events can trigger post-traumatic stress disorder. And what is counterintuitive and uh, very interesting is that after the expulsion, the somatic and mental illnesses in the victim of mobbing may intensify. So uh, intuitively, we would, we would expect that if somebody leaves the workplace after all of this uh, cycle of abuse, they're going to feel better. But what, uh, what this researcher, uh, Swedish researcher, Heinz Leimann, what he found was that people actually felt worse after the expulsion uh, and they had to deal with the aftermath of the workplace mobbing. Okay. And, and who, do we have any ideas, any, evidence or statistics at all on who the typical targets and perpetrators of this situation uh, are or is it is it any potentially anybody mm -hmm. so uh there 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 is workplace bu bullying institute so the term workplace mobbing is used interchangeably with the term workplace bullying I personally prefer, prefer uh, I personally prefer the term workplace mobbing uh, because uh, mobbing it emphasizes that it is a group behavior. Uh, so, but there is workplace bullying institute in uh, the United States um, uh, pioneered by uh, Gary Nami, and so I I found uh, his his article from 2007 where he says that bullies target people they perceive to be personally threatening. So um, they believe uh, Gary Nami he believes that uh, it is the ideal employees who get targets. So those who are very uh, productive and competent and uh, highly moral, um, so and honest in principle that they get targeted. But in, in principle, anybody can get targeted. Women are twice as likely to be bullied than men, and men are twice as likely to be bullies. So there is these statistics. Um, so that's as far as, as what we know about this. Okay. And in terms of the emotional abuse aspect and the the targeting and scapegoating dynamic of this situation, is there typically somebody at the core of this who has nar narcissistic personality disorder or so something along those mm -hmm. lines? Like, I know we can't diagnose people, but is there usually a, patho a, a character pathology at the center mm -hmm. of this? So, uh, yes, so I cannot say whether there is a usually this component, but 
if a narcissist, uh, somebody who has narcissistic traits, if they are involved in work workplace mobbing, it can, it can be particularly devastating because uh, if somebody has narcissistic traits where are basically grandiosity, need for admiration, uh, and lack of empathy. So these are these would be some pathological individuals uh, who are particularly difficult to deal with in terms of how they perpetrate abuse. Uh, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't a, a study that says that if there is workplace bullying or workplace mobbing, that it has to be a narcissist. Uh, so I would say that the relationship is particular. It is particularly devastating if if a narcissist is involved, but it's not necessarily a narcissist. In fact, in fact, what may happen is that it is a systemic issue. So the entire workplace, the entire organization may behave like a big narcissist. So the whole system may have narcissistic traits. And what happens is that the system brings up the worst in the employees, in the people. So while, because you know, every, every person has narcissistic traits. Um, so we all have a healthy dose of narcissism. And what may happen if it is a toxic work environment, if it is a structure and culture that has narcissistic traits, it can bring up the worst in everybody. And so uh, even though typically those would not be, people would not be acting this way, but there is something to be said about the system. Okay. Okay, that actually brings me to my next question then when there mm -hmm. are policies or laws or things on the books that discuss workplace harassment what workplace mobbing is how are these things still able to go on is it perhaps that they may be weaponized against the the target so that their perception so that they're they're basically gaslit so that their perception isn't what they think it is in the policy I don't know if that made sense at all, but these yeah, things are, okay. <laughs> yeah, I understand what your question is. So um, I think in order to answer your question, um, uh, maybe we can look at sexual harassment because sexual harassment is against the law. And uh, there is a little bit more history about, uh, there is a little bit more history of, um, that sexual harassment is deemed as illegal because workplace mobbing is not illegal in, in most countries is not. Uh, and so um, in the example of sexual harassment, uh, we had this case of Harvey Weinstein, the Me Too movement. And despite the fact that it is illegal and despite the fact that there are policies at workplaces and that there are laws that protect, are supposed to protect against it, it was still happening. So um, just because something is illegal, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And uh, one of the reasons why it doesn't happen is that institutions have a way of, you know, there is this phrase by Peter Druckmann that culture eats policy for breakfast every day of the week. So Policies are policies, but culture of the workplace is a culture. And so there can be a culture of silence, a culture of not reporting, a culture of circumventing uh, workplace um, policies. And so, uh, yes, uh, it, and sometimes if, if, those, if workplace policies are used in cynical way, they can be weaponized against uh, the target of workplace mobbing. So there was one case uh, where a professor of anthropology, uh, she uh, wrote a book that is called Mob Mobbed! Exc exclamation mark. Uh, if people can Google it. I don't recall her name uh, at this moment, but she definitely was the target of mobbing even uh, she was even uh, a target of an fbi investigation that didn't find anything uh, and so she was the one who brought to the forefront the fact that anti-bullying policies can be used against targets of workplace mobbing because if you paint the the target as a bully because you know you can pay them as a difficult person or somebody, so you can pay, paint the target as a bully. 
uh, and then use the policy against the target. So this is why it is so important to keep, continue to emphasize that this is a group behavior, that this is a systemic behavior, so that one individual doesn't get uh, scapegoated, uh, even using the very policies that are supposed to protect them from, from such a behavior. I don't know if I answered your question or not. I hope that was making sense. You absolutely did. Thank you, because that that brings me perfectly then to something that I would like to discuss with you that, that you've actually talked about in your videos. So with that said, what are some, if, if somebody realizes now after watching this video, okay, they're, be, they're being targeted in the workplace, they're being mobbed, what are some things that they should avoid doing, some mistakes, to, to learn from people who've made mistakes, followed by some things that perhaps might be might be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I I probably will not be exhaustive to list all of the things I list in my videos. So I'll refer people to watch my videos. Sure. Uh, one one mistake uh, that uh, uh, comes to my mind immediately uh, is. So this workplace bullying, um, excuse, 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 yeah, workplace bullying institute did a study in 2012, I believe, uh, and they studied what happens if um, targets of workplace bullying if they go to HR, and so this workplace bullying institute found out that in less than two percent of all of the cases, HR was helpful. Uh, so it doesn't mean, I'm not saying don't go to HR, by all means, if you want to go, then if you decide, but then brace yourself. Uh, so it's important to understand that it doesn't always resolve that way. Um, so I, I did prepare a list of what to do, like first aid of activities of what to do if you are a target of workplace mobbing. Uh, so the number one uh, thing that you may want to do is uh, to write down a timeline of events. So you basically identify uh, the abusive acts that have been used against you. Uh, you brush up on the definition of uh, emotional and narcissistic abuse. And you basically write uh, a document that is in two columns. In one column, you write the date and in the other column you write the abusive behaviors. And this is helpful uh, because emotional abuse sometimes also involves the technique of gaslighting. Uh, and gaslighting is to deny the reality of a different person, is to basically to make them doubt that what is happening is actually happening and make them uh, doubt in their reality. And so this practice of writing down what happens, it counteracts these ta emotionally abusive tactics. So um, the next uh, step would be to name the phenomenon for what it is, uh, that it is workplace mobbing and maybe to um, brush up and if, even there, there are books about workplace uh, uh, mobbing. Uh, so read a little bit about the phenomenon so you know what it is, to, because by naming it, we take away the sting from it, because if we don't know what it is, um, it's harder to deal with it. The next uh, first aid would be to separate your identity from the position you hold in your workplace. So because um, the mobbers, they have a lot of power over us, if, uh, if we think that that position that we hold, we hold at the workplace is all who we are. So basically try to reconnect with your family, with your friends, with supportive individuals, do, uh, do some hobby activities to make sure that you have a sense of your identity that is different from your position in the workplace. The next uh, step is to prepare an exit strategy to leave your job. It doesn't mean that you have to leave your job. I don't want to scare anybody here, uh, but having a strategy, it also takes away the sting from the fear response that we may um, encounter. Uh, formulate a plan B is the next step. So if, if you didn't work at the work where, where you work right now, it, what, what else would you be doing? 
uh, assess your finances and make a plan of existence for the situation where you are unemployed for a period of time. Uh, so again, uh, planning for the worst outcome, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but being prepared. Uh, utilize some coping strategies. So I'm actually working on a book um, about self-care and work. And so I already finished the book and I'm in the process of editing it. Whenever it comes out, I will post it on my uh, uh, web page, which is hopefully going to be linked to this video. So there will be some coping strategies there too. Uh, one yeah, one coping strategy that I want to mention in particular is to find meaning in your work and in your life to, to continue to look for what gives you meaning. This is called logotherapy. Uh, so you may have heard about Viktor Frankl. He survived Holocaust. And so he is the founder of logotherapy. And so logotherapy is particularly useful and helpful in situations where we experience very adverse life events. So uh, to continue to discern what gives you meaning and act on your meaning, so act on your values. Um, so instead of the mobbers dictating what you're going to do in your life, you act on what you think is important in life. So that's one coping st strategy that I would endorse in particular. Uh, the next thing is to establish some trust circles. Uh, so um, it's, it's easy to um, go into one of the extremes. So either don't trust anybody or be so needy and so powerless and so much looking for somebody to solve our, our problem that we end up trusting people who are not trustworthy. So basically spending some time um, making our circle of, of trust. So these are, the, these are the people who are in my innermost circle of trust. These are people with whom I have some porous boundaries and these are people whom I don't trust. And what is important here is that if I do not trust somebody, that it means I'm not going to take what they tell me about me. Uh, so, right, if, if they are not a reliable source of information, I'm not going to, to consider uh, their, their communications about me as trustworthy. Uh, I hope I'm not uh, I'm not overdoing this. Not I, at all. Please, yeah, I please have a long continue. List. Absolutely. Uh, so, yes. The next step is to utilize problem solving. So problem solving is basically instead of act, acting on our emotions, and instead of having reactions, we plan our actions deliberately. And so before we act, we, we consider what will be the consequences of these actions. Because um, as much as I believe that the, the listeners of this podcast, of this video, they will want some advice, but I want to give the power back to the listeners. You are the one who knows the best what's going to work for you. If you utilize your problem solving skills, if you think, uh, if you make, if you brainstorm and make a list of all of the possible things you can do, and then think about what would be the consequences of what you do, you will, you will come up with a pretty compelling plan for yourself. And I want to specifically to make people beware of bad advice. My advice, including my advice is good advice, I believe, but be, beware of any advice uh, because there is a lot of uh, advice out there because the, the, the topic of workplace mobbing, there is not enough uh, public awareness about it. And so I did come across on some channels that said, oh, you should go confront the bully or go uh, contact HR. And mm -hmm. technically that sounds like a good, good advice, but it's not always appropriate uh, for you. So basically before you follow any advice, you think about what the consequences are going to be and how does this advice compare to research findings about workplace mobbing. So this is kind of exhaustive list that, that I prepared for today. Thank you so much. And thank you actually for validating that piece about the bad advice, because I would say 95% of the time that will be the immediate thing that somebody says, oh, so you didn't report it to HR. Like that would 
like that solves it. But like you were saying, it only helps in maybe 2% of the cases. It really is not necessarily effective. So that gives some, that gives some peace of mind to the, the target, in my opinion, that it's, it's really not that simple. You were, it was the dynamic and you were already, the dynamic of the situation is such that they have to have a scapegoat. So you were already in that process. You couldn't stop it. Yes. And so I would, I would uh, mention that there is this concept of trauma-informed care. So if you look for anybody uh, to give you advice for a therapist or a legal advisor, uh, it's good to look for somebody who is familiar with trauma-informed care. Um, and so basically the idea is um, that it's, it's important to empower, um, if, if you are getting advice from somebody, if, if you feel worse after that, then it's good to pay attention to your feelings. Like, how did you feel when you hear that advice? So your feelings are important. Your feelings are markers to, to make you, to help you decide whether or not you're going to follow it. Uh, and so uh, in, in terms of traumatic events, what is important to remember is that any behavior that, that a person has when dealing with work, workplace mobbing is, a, is they're just trying to do the best they can in the situation under the circumstances. So um, I, I, want, I listed some suggestions, right? Some, something that you can follow, but I don't want anybody to think, oh, I didn't do this or I didn't do that and then feel bad. You were doing the best you could under the circumstances. And even the advice that I listed here it may or may not work for you. So it's important to, to really feel empowered to trust your own, your own uh, strengths. So uh, even writing down a list of your strengths or the social support, if you have any social support, if you have any kind of situation that makes you financially more stable, uh, your intelligence, your ability to research things, all of those things are, um, are assets that you can use to help yourself in the in situation of workplace mobbing. Workplace mobbing is, is a complex situation. So it's not the kind of thing that you like, you say one, two, three and done. You know, it's not a, you know, you do a breathing, breathing exercise and you lower down your heart rate. That's something you can do, but um, workplace mobbing is a more complex situation. And so everything you do to help yourself every day with it, um, it, you should give yourself credit for it. Dr. Bihun, that was fantastic advice. This has been a wonderful conversation and I've learned so much and I know other people have and will and also those who are in a relationship with somebody or who love somebody who might be going through this. I know you mentioned that you have a book coming out and I will be linking in the, the show notes a a link to your YouTube channel as well, and especially your workplace mobbing videos, but where is the best place that people can find you? Is YouTube and your website the best? Yes, so my, the YouTube channel and my website are the, are the best places to find me. And on my website, there is my uh, email address, so you can write to me there. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't uh, don't have the, the book is not out yet, and I have not found a publisher yet. I'm I'm checking all of the grammar on it, <laughs> and uh, so hopefully it's it's been one and a half years I've been writing it, so it's been a while. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's so exciting, and congratulations on on doing something so amazing like that. That's your uh, it. When it does come out and you do find that publisher, it will be fantastic. And I'm really grateful to you that you put this information out there on the internet for people such as myself to access. Thank you very much for doing that. And I'm, I'm thrilled and honored that you could join me today for this short but very informative conversation, Dr. Bihun. Thank you very much, Ms. Osmond. Your channel is great, and I'm, I'm so glad to have been featured. This is my first YouTube interview, and YouTuber to YouTuber, it's great to make such personal connections. I feel the same way, and you did fantastic. <laughs> you did just, you. just great. Thank you so much again. Thanks.